Hey guys, this is Mr. Arvitus. I'm back. Uh, so there's a couple of questions about the World War II video that I created, uh, mainly dealing with the politics of the Nazi party. So I figured I'd make a quick little, this is probably only about 10 minutes, to kind of explain how the political movement also coincided with all of Hitler's comings and goings. So I think, so before we get really kind of into it, we need to make a couple of big assertions and we need to make a couple of big statements. One, the Nazis are incredibly organized. Uh, this is one of the most organized political parties in the 20th century. They do everything in unison and they target areas very, very well. Uh, you can talk about the racial ideologies, you can talk about all the evilness that, that they do, and, and that's all true, uh, but you have to recognize the fact that Joseph Goebbels in particular uh, is somewhat brilliant in how he organizes politically. Now, he uses the worst aspects of people. He uses fear, he uses hate, he uses all these things to kind of get people on his side, but Goebbels in particular uh, is going to control the message for the Nazis. And that's a big thing. The Nazis always want to control the message. So when you sit there and think to yourself about a Nazi, uh, what you think of is the uniform. And the uniform is very clean cut, and they march. And, and if you know the march that they do, right, it's all lockstep in unison. And those marches took place in the small towns and cities in Germany very frequently. When we get to the you know late 1920s, 1929, 1930, when they start to win elections, they are doing movements almost on a daily basis where they march through the streets, they wave their banners, right, the swastika, they have their little eagle standards, they, they go through and they're doing their little, you know, Nazi stuff, and then they have a rally at the town square where they harp on whatever issue is important in that town, and I think that's very important. In certain areas where anti-Semitism was very prevalent, the Nazis advertised that extensively. In other areas where anti-Semitism wasn't very prevalent, the Nazis kind of steered away from that, and for those of you who are thinking, well, how can people not find out? I mean, this is pre-internet. You know, you have the radio, but they don't necessarily talk about that stuff on the radio. And so there just wasn't that median to control it. And so the Nazis also put out a lot of literature. Uh, you know, Hermann Goring in particular has a whole bunch of stuff put out in Berlin uh, that kind of advertises the heroic nature of the Nazis, the nationalism, the pride in Germany, all these things. Uh, but Joseph Goebbels in particular is going to put out a whole bunch of propaganda posters. And so politically, what did the Nazis actually say? Well, their policy was essentially akin to, uh, you know, bringing Germany back to its roots, was, was making Germany a powerful nation. And so there's a couple of big things the Nazis promoted. One was the family union unit. The Nazis are extensively talking about families, and they want the, the, the ideal family, right? You have the father who works and provides for everybody. You have the mother who raises the children, who in theory will be nice Nazis, and you have two to three kids. And that's the theory behind their, their thing. And you, a lot of the propaganda posters, um, a lot of the propaganda posters that you see are of families, uh, or the working class, very big into the working class. They also will do propaganda posters that are very anti-communist, they're going to portray the communists as you know rats and things of that nature, uh, as they, they will with Jews uh, as well in certain parts of Germany. And so we see a very concentrated effort to do these things. Now, what's their big message nationally? Their big message nationally is economics. And I told you in the last video, the Nazis don't rise to power without a poor economic situation. They simply don't. Hitler was, was not going to become an elected official uh, outside of a depression. And when the depression did happen in 1929 and 1930, that's when the Nazis really begin to win elections. And they do so uh, almost in, in a very uh, kind of organized way. So what they do is they target certain areas that they know they can win in 1930 and 1931, and they're going to focus a lot of money and a lot of intent on winning those Reichstag seats. And then as they move forward, they're going to branch out, okay? And so what are the central messages they go with? One, uh, obviously they want to promote that classic Germany, the, the, the classic family that is the Germans. Uh, and they also talk about the Volk a lot, right? The people, right? The, in the fatherland. And so very nationalistic. They always talk about the Versailles Treaty, and they always talk about a abolishing it. Um, but more specifically, the Nazi party's agenda is about putting people back to work. Okay? It is it, it is basically entirely focused on that. It's about getting people working and about avoiding the traps of foreign nations. And in particular, you know, th they do talk about Russia a lot uh, and the communism under Joseph Stalin. They criticize it heavily. And so the Nazis kind of go in that. Now, the other thing they do, and there is a terror component that we should probably understand about the Nazis' political rise in power. And that terror component uh, deals with the SA. Uh, the SA, led by Ernest Rahm, is going to interrupt a lot of political rallies. And so what they will do 
is they'll dress like normal civilians and they'll go to a communist rally and uh, you always use like the joke like they throw a chair right and then they cause a fight and so the newspaper story isn't going to be Nazis cause fight at communist rally it's going to be fight breaks out at communist rally and so that's one of the things the Nazis are going to continuously do and they don't just do it to the communists they do it to the liberals they do it to the conservative party um, in fact one of the big things that we should probably mention is the conservative party in Germany uh, which was the you know one of the more dominant parties uh, they're the ones who had the majority for most of the Weimar Republic, which was that republic that, that formed after World War I. But the conservative party, almost in 1932, began to accept the Nazis and began to think that they could control them. And that's the big issue that we see, is that there's a, a, a lot of people who believe that the Nazis can be controlled. And they look at Hitler in that same way. They think they can control Hitler and that he won't do all the things that he says he will do. Um, I you know, it's funny because people say, well, well, it's inevitable that he takes power. No, it's not. There's a lot of luck. There's a lot of things that go into Hitler taking power. And we have to understand that the conservative party is one of the reasons that happens. Uh, they concede a lot to the Nazis. Uh, they try and, again, make deals with them because they think they're on the same type of level. Um, but the Nazis are not a clear-cut conservative party. And this is where people a lot of times get confused with fascism and Nazism. Um, some people, I think, say that it's a complete like all the way to the right movement. Other people say, no, this is just uh, socialism, communism, because they do you know, the National Socialist Party. It's neither, to be honest. Uh, it does have a, a lot of conservative uh, backings for it. Uh, you know, Hitler is going to have a lot of private industry. There's a lot of private industry, but they're going to have a lot of government contracts. And so a lot of the economic success that Hitler's going to have is because he gets rid of the Versailles Treaty, right? He gets rid of all of the, the various restrictions and starts to build up the military, starts to build panzer tanks, right? So these things are going to immensely improve Germany's economy. And it's nothing special that he does. He just arms the country. You know, the United States in 1940, 41, 42, uh, as World War II breaks out, that's how they get out of the Depression, right? They, they arm the country, they arm the British, right, with, with supplies. And that's how we get a lot of people to work. So there are some similarities in that. But we have to kind of make sure that we understand that all of those similarities end when you start talking about racial ideologies uh, when it comes to the Jews. Though, if we're being very honest, we could also say that you know the United States, and Eleanor Roosevelt said it best, and we talked about it in my class, one of the largest failures of the New Deal is that it does not talk about Jim Crow laws because FDR was afraid of losing votes in the South. And you know when we talk about the Nuremberg laws, when Hitler takes power, there's a lot of uh, fear over how far should they go with the Jewish question, quote unquote. Um, and, and really, it's in 1935 that they're going to start to create the Nuremberg Laws. Um, and Hitler was actually kind of apprehensive. He didn't know if the people would fully support it yet. Um, and it wasn't until Joseph Goebbels gives a speech, gives a, a, a large speech uh, over the radio and then also in front of a, a large group of Nazi uh, supporters at a rally, and he gets a standing ovation. And this speech was not designed. Uh, Hitler said no one should talk about this, but he talked about laws restricting the rights of Jews. And it's in 1935, and it's at that point where Hitler all of a sudden just changes everything he's going to talk about, and they go on the same thing. And Goebbels begins to get on the radio. And so we talk about the you know how does the average German buy into that ideology. Well, Goebbels is on the radio and the newspapers every single day talking about the evils of the Jewish people. And that's how it kind of builds up. Um, so if we're really kind of summarizing how the Nazis rose to power politically, we have to look at the, the factors I've kind of shown you. One, they're highly organized, highly organized. Everything about them, every one of their marches, their rallies, everything is very clean cut, very organized to the T, okay? So high level organization, uh, immense use of propaganda on the radio waves or in flyers and newspapers, so immense use of propaganda. And then lastly, I think we have to look at the conservative party in Germany. And so the conservative party in Germany are going to be the ones who give Hitler emergency powers and they're ultimately going to be the ones that give Hitler the kings to the, the Reich, okay? And they're going to create the Third Reich uh, by, by basically giving him emergency powers and by giving him whatever he wants, it seems, at the beginning. And so I think that's very important for us to kind of go with. So I hope this video kind of helped you guys out in understanding some of the political you know, aspects of the, the Nazis. There are, are a lot of really good books on this that you can look up. But really, if you want to see a decent documentary, go on Netflix uh, and, and they have the, the Hitler's Inner Circle. Uh, it's really good. It kind of, the first two episodes kind of go over this. So it's pretty solid for your watching. So I hope this clarified some issues and I'll see you next time when we start talking about Japan and Russia uh, and the Italians.
All right.